Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to this session on caching, titled Caching 101, Caching on the JVM and Beyond. Um, so this is Alex Snaps. He's a colleague of mine working at Terracotta on EHCache for a large number of years now. Um, and this is Louis. He's a manager that needs to be highlighted, but he also codes. And he actually can code, just never ask him to do any regex. Yeah. That's where stuff is. Yeah, let's not get there. Let's not get there quite yet. So in two days, three hours, minus a break at one point, um, we want to cover a number of things. First of all, Let's do some theory. I mean, we're lacking that. And we'll probably have one or two equations along the path. Um, then we want to move on to caching patterns. Um, some of them are really interesting and not that known. And so we want, them, we want you to learn about them and dare then use them in your applications. Um, and at the end, one cool thing to do with caching is scaling. But that, of course, has a number of problems associated with it. And so um, we'd like to finish up on that. But first, you tell us about yourself yeah. a little bit. So first of all, who knows nothing about caching? I know nothing, but yeah, you'll except, see about except that. you. <laughs> okay, so a few hands still. So that's good. You should learn something for sure. Hopefully, <laughs> let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, who already uses some kind of caching in production? Wow. You can leave. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, well, maybe, maybe not, actually. Yeah. Who had caching-related problems in production? Well, All right, yeah. So you that can means stay. half of you implemented it correctly. I mean, it's good. <laughs> um, and one last, who's interested in advanced caching patterns? Cool. So that's probably the good session, then. Great. Uh, if we're up to it. Any other question you want? No, I don't. Well, all right, let's do the usual poll. Who knows about EHCache? I should. Uh, right, what? you should. Um, who knows about Terracotta? Quite a bit. Let's continue that route. Who knows about Quartz? All right, that's good. All right, who knows about auto caching? Oh, no, we don't care about that. <laughs> So, a bit of theory, caching theory. Um, yeah. There are only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. So we're really bad, so we won't tackle the second one. We'll just discuss a little bit the first one today. Um, and of course, you've got variants on that one with a n1 by of by one errors and stuff like that. But so clearly, caching, while a widely known solution, like you, most of you showed up hands, um, is a complicated one. Complex to implement, complex to get correctly. Um, and so that's what we want to discuss. But so first of all, we are surrounded by caches when in IT. And if we go down to the metal, um, if you go to the CPU level, CPUs nowadays are pretty complex. Yay, that shows great on that big screen. So that's a new more architecture, CPU diagram, um, where you've got a number of interesting things. Like this is a core. So you've got 8, 16, 32 of them here on two different sockets. Um, that's the first level cache on these CPUs. Then you've got a second level cache, which, as you can see, is shared by two cores. And then you move on to even higher levels, where you start sharing across another number of CPUs and with different topologies like L3 or NUMA. Um, and so the first thing you need to realize is that when, when you talk about caching data, it means something that lived in memory is now actually potentially copied in four different locations, down to the CPU register and then up in the different caches. Um, and so the first thing that a CPU has to deal with 
is everything that's linked to cash coherence. So you, of, of the people who had issues in production, any of you had issues with cash coherency? Couple events. Yeah. Okay. And the others, it's because you don't know, or it's really a different problem? <laughs> okay. They know it's a problem. <laughs> so, how do we define cache coherence? Let's take a process, writes A to some location X, and then the same process reads that, reads that same location. We probably want to be able to read A when no writes happen in between. And by the way, this remains valid for a single processor. So that means that you should read your writes. And it's highly desirable. Just imagine what happens if you write A and then you get B out of the blue. Like, what? Then take two processes. P2 writes A to X, and P1 reads, reads X. And here we start getting into the funky dealing of coherency, because it returns A if enough time has elapsed. And while we don't want to delve too deep in what enough time means, that's the reality of like CPU-level cache coherency algorithm. It really depends, because fetching data from memory is so costly that it might be better to let the CPU just run a number of operations on wrong data before telling it to stop rather than forcing him to wait to make sure the data is correct. And then you've got one last, which is P1 rates, writes A to X, then P2 writes B to X, and you can, you can show that there is a sequence in between these two writes. Um, and if you have that sequence, then you never want anyone to be able to see B and then A. Because then that would mean that you don't have right ordering. And that's also pretty bad. The funny thing is that, as we will see during the talk, most of this stuff, I mean, just like the title says, there is a CPU nowhere in the title. You probably want these kind of rules for your caches, from local caches in your application up to distributed caches of multi terabyte across many VMs. So, but why do we cache? So, who has ever seen that diagram or a clone of it? Okay, so while researching the talk, because the problem with that is that this is highly volatile data. I mean, we get new technology really fast in our industry, and so if you take that from two years ago, it probably doesn't match the reality of today. So I found a cool, like on the Berkeley, Berkeley um, website, they have that one, and you see there's a slider on the top right. So it's not the web page, I didn't dare try the network. But so when you go there, you can slide and see how stuff evolves. Because like for example, the send the 2K bytes over the network was supposed to be in the later column that other stuff you find on the left. But actually technology moving forward, it became faster than other things. So it's the same, when you do caching, you need to think about exactly what you're trying to protect against. Um, but so, these are pretty much complicated and hard to read numbers. So again, translating these numbers um, into um, meaningful time for us humans. Like if you go down from L1 cache reference, which takes a second, so that's two heartbeats, um, up to a mutex lock unlock, which is yeah the time your machine makes a coffee, I guess. I'm not so much of a coffee drinker, so if I'm off, don't blame me. Um, and then 2K over network, commodity, yes, but probably 10 gig, 4.2 seconds. Oh, seconds? You, you Crap, that's a typo. Minutes. That was yeah. an M there. My bad. Or oh, it's a very short song. No, 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 it's a minute. It's a typo. My bad. Um, but so we're clearly already changing um, the scale. And then if you keep going, so compressing 1K is 33 minutes. Um, reading one meg from memory, it's two hours. Um, reading the same meg from SSD is 2.6 days. So that's really impressive. Um, and of course, one thing that didn't change is like the packet round trip from California to Belgium, um, 4.8 years, which is a thesis. So if you have multi data center setups, you probably don't want to have to fetch the data across data centers all the time. Um, 
So from those figures, I guess it is very obvious that what we want, what we use caching in order to keep the data closest to where it needs to be yeah. for long periods. And so that's clearly a performance concern. So when you look into some theory behind performance, um, one law that comes back often is Amdahl's law, um, which initially talks about parallelization. Told you, equation. Um, on that equation, you need to look at P as the parallel proportion. So something that you can parallelize in your application, in your program, like in a fraction of that, so from 10% to 90%, or even more, and would be the process account. And what Amdahl's law tells us is that even if you have 95% parallelization, which is the green line on top, you'll only ever be able to f speed up by 20 times. So it's not like you get infinity scaling. As soon as you have remaining sequential operations, which I guess every program has at one point, because even when you do MapReduce, at the end you still need to collect the results. <laughs> um, but so that's parallelization. So it's kind of a bit on the side from um, caching as we I mean, by default, seed. But the same law can be applied to sequential information. And so here, what it says is that the maximum speed up um, is that formula, where P was the times some part of your application was sped up, and F is the fraction of the time not improved. And so if you look at the diagram on the right, you've got two independent parts, E and B, that are your business execution. Um, the first line below that is actually working really hard to make B five times faster. Does that sound like a good deal? While the last one, the last line, is just working on, on A and just making it two times faster. So you clearly see that there is higher gain on what's slower. I mean, making faster the slower bits, um, and that sometimes just going crazy on optimizing a bit of your code while not realizing that it's not causing that much latency overall uh, makes little sense. So that's quick introduction. Um, Andal's law, today you'll see it linked with Gustafsson's law, which states that computation that have like really large data set or arbitrary large data sets can be efficiently parallelized. So it's a bit more, a more modern version of Andal's law. Um, and what that says is that when computing powers grow, you can solve larger problems in a given time. And of course, like if you're looking for performance, wanting to use caching, that's also one of the returns you can get. You may not be able to do what you wanted to do in less time because of the sequential bits but you may be able to just analyze more data. And so the, the good um, analogy to understand the difference between the two laws is that boot of an operating system, where if you, if you were to boot Windows XP, as I show here, on faster and faster CPUs, at one point it wouldn't boot any faster. But as your CPU grows, what you can do is actually when you log in, like when you can finally log in into Windows XP, you've got way more stuff already loaded and ready to be used. So that's Amdahl versus Gustafsson's laws. Oh, we forgot to say one thing. Did we? Yeah, please interrupt if you have questions, comments, anything, because we're here for a long time, so don't hesitate. Um, let's not wait uh, till the end for everything. One question would be, why would you boot XP, though? Uh, because I have a VM and I really need to check something. No, I don't know. Whatever. Oh. <laughs> so, from there, where and when to use a cache? Well, I guess we're going to have the cheesy answer. It depends. Measure. Do not guess. So, once more, we're looking at performance-oriented solution. Caching is a performance-oriented solution. It comes with drawbacks that we'll discuss later. Um, so just don't activate caching because it looks cool. I mean, listening on Stack Overflow question, you see like questions coming in. Oh, guys, yeah, I just activated caching and it's not faster. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. 
Was it slow before? Is it as slow? Or was it fast enough before and it remains fast enough? I don't know, it depends. Um, the, if you're loading two records from a single table, guess what? It's not going to change a lot. Well, and actually, it's going to change something always. Um, and, and that has to do with the in quote, well, cash currency <laughs> per se, which is if you, if, if you use caching, you need to maintain this cash, right? Like just put things in it, then get it from there. Doing that has an overhead always. Um, I realize I'll, I'll talk about a concrete example further down the path, but um, right. So caching comes at a cost. So you need to make sure that you apply caching in the proper places. And the way to figure out where you need to do that, the only way to do that is to actually measure things and, and, and reason things from there. So let's jump directly into what concerns I guess most of you guys, which is writing Java application and making them performant enough. In that context, what do we view as a cache in such an application? First of all, it's a data structure, and it holds a temporary copy of some data. Like, temporary is highlighted because that's really core to caching. You're making a trade-off. You're having higher memory consumption for reduced latency. So you want stuff to go faster on one side, but it's going to mean more memory is going to be used. So also that's something you have to think about, because sometimes you need that memory for something else. And so by definition, reading these two um, lines, it applies mostly to data which you can reuse and data which is expensive to compute or retrieve. Um, basic math, probably not very useful. Just redo them, like computing a VAT on an order might not be worth caching. Um, if you have like a huge graph of objects, yeah, it might be a good idea to cache that hash code in order to not pre-compute it each time. Um, just two small examples um, give you an idea. Does anyone disagree with what's there or think something is missing? Cool. So then a bit more on what we want with regards to features. So one thing we said, since we're trading memory, we want something to control the capacity of our caches. We don't want them to grow unbounded. But that means eviction. Eviction is the process. You've got 20 entries in your cache. You've said, my cache should have 20 entries. You add the 21st entry to there. One of the first 20 goes out. You've got a VM under, under stress. Potentially, your cache as a system to be fed that information, or you just put stuff on another cache, but you have a relation between the two caches, and you get stuff evicted. It's also very important to understand that. Because it means, since stuff can get evicted at any time, up to the implementers, um, that a cache that never stores anything should be a valid replacement for your cache use case. The only impact it should have is on performance. If the cache stores no data at all, then you are in a proper caching use case. Because the only thing you do is you always hit the database, you always hit that crazy web service, you always go to the outside world to get the answer again. Who can say that if they were, if they were to size all their caches to zero, the application would still function properly? Yay, a few hands. So you tested that. Yay, they're saying yes. Cool. We need more hands. So um, Funny um, thing on that, so um, two weeks ago, Java 1, um, w there was a bird of a feather session on Jcache 2, so trying to move the standard in Java world. Right. Who, who knows about JSR 107 in this room? Okay. Cool. That's oh, good. Oh, then we have oh, a few slides later. Right. Also known as Jcache, which we'll yeah. talk about that, which is yeah. the standard way to use caching in Java that was introduced last year. So that's what so we'll, we'll get there. To. We'll, we'll give you details on that. But so. No need, you don't need that background to get that. 
And so we had a number of cash implementers in the room. And one thing we all agreed on was like, if it doesn't have eviction, if it doesn't support eviction, then it's not a caching use case. And that's coming from multiple vendors that have products that can be both a cache or a store. Uh, but clearly, we all agreed that caching use cases mean supporting eviction. So that's really, that's why, again, it's the first bullet point on this slide. It's really something you need to take into account. Yeah, and certainly you, you should be very careful when you assess like your architecture when not when they're at the beginning or further down the path to introduce caching, to never use like misuse the terms here, because yeah. uh, this is probably this could lead to big trouble in production systems further down the path. The second one is you're copying that data, and you remember there was that temporary keyword. Because, of course, if you're making a copy of the data it, and you support eviction, it means the data really lives elsewhere. What happens when the data change? How long should I keep that copy around? So here, you really want data freshness slash expiry as a feature. So you want to be able to tell your cache, oh, please, keep these entries for that amount of time. I guess that's pretty clear expiry. Then you clearly want also a way to preserve the consistency of your data. Sure, you said only 20 seconds for that data to be around in the cache. But something really big happened on the back end, whatever that is. I don't, I don't care. You really need that result to be out of the cache now for the next guy to recompute it. You need some invalidation. You need to be able to tell to the cache, oh, forget about that. Whatever you hold, it's no longer the truth. Um, and my application will rebuild the truth um, when, when it's needed again. So something at the data con consistency um, invalidation level. Fault tolerance. I mean, it's really crappy when your application crashes because the cache crashed. So on one side, we say you should not rely on the cache. I mean, a cache of size zero should not be a problem for your app. And on the other side, you get an exception out of the cache that gives an error page to the user, hopefully a proper one, not just a stack trace. And that's coming from the cache. That feels like counterproductive. There we go. So yeah, so I guess yeah, go ahead. You, you are handing me over. <laughs> we totally <laughs> rehearsed this. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, JSL 107. So JSL 107 is um, a JCP-driven standard that was finalized after 13 years or oh, something. I, yeah. Like a very long time. This is why it has the number 107. Um, and um, so it, it got finalized March 2014. Um, and it's a spec that tries to address the problem of caching um, in, f for the Java platform. Um, so the, the, the paragraph there specifies API and semantics for temporary in-memory caching. The bold stuff is mine. Um, this is not how it's being introduced on the JCP website, but this is taken from the JCP website. For Java objects, including object creation, shared access, spooling, validation, and consistency across JVMs. So it does mention something about, about um, topologies. So the Java X.cache API, uh, which targets a C, so it means it's, it's, it's not part of EE as of now, but um, it certainly can be used in Java IC. It's, it's not bundled with the JDK. You have to download the API separately. Uh, but it, it's to be used in any um, Java environment. So it comes with a bunch of things. It comes with um, cache managers that host surprise manages your caches. Uh, so managing the caches is everything around the lifecycle, um, most importantly, um, with regards to the spec at least. It does address expiry, which is something that we said we wanted, yep. so that's good. It comes with an integration module. So the integration module helps you building 
Um, cache through systems. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see what that yeah, means further we'll down the path. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll demo all of that. But effectively, your cache knows how to populate itself and how to um, write updates to an underlying system of record. Um, it comes with cache entry listeners. They're part of this pack. Should I say something about that? I shouldn't. I, I'm not really sh sure what what you really want to use that for, to be honest. L let's say that cache entry listeners are something that sounds like a good idea initially. Then you think about the implementation details and what they really mean. Then you look at how they've been used so far, at least in EH cache, where in EH cache 2x they were used for um, anything that's um, not clustering but replication. And you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. So, and then you go back to the use case, and like, exactly, listeners, are you sure you don't need a proper replication module and so, not something? And then logging for cache activities? So let's ask, so anybody using some kind of listening mechanism on their cache in order to do any application-driven logic? Okay, that's a whole. Oh, we got a maybe. room of smart guys. Maybe. Keep it like that. <laughs> so it comes with entry processor, with, which lets you uh, mutate um, entries in your cache atomically. It uh, lets you execute some piece of code, being sure that no, no other thread will come and, and do stuff on, on that entry. Yeah, so GSR 107 is actually um, Java 1.6 compliant. Right. Um, and so it's not really a lambda that you pass in, but it's an anonymous, anonymous um, inner class with a single method, so it can be used as a lambda in Java 8. And yeah, like Alex said, a block of code that gets executed against a single entry. It comes with caching annotations. So that's what anybody using this thing called Spring in this room? All righty. Anybody has seen a caching annotation on Spring? Couple of people, so they're pretty much that. Not as powerful, but effectively let you annotate methods on 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 the class, um, and for instance, say that you want this whatever this method returns be cached. Um, there are a bunch of ways to dis define like exactly the, how the key will be created based on the arguments passed to the method, um, and so that you can cache pretty transparently um, like an existing. Uh, um, application. And finally, it also comes with some management. Um, I, there are two um, JMX beans that you get that let you see a little bit what's going on in your app um, at the cache level. So it comes with basic stats support um, and lets you, I think, shut the entire thing down if you want, the management stuff. Anyways. Let's do a little Some bit access more. to configuration also. Um, one thing about the caching annotations, the semantics of the GSR 107 annotations and the ones from Spring are slightly different. So you can't just switch from one to the other without looking. You need to have a look at the specifics and, and where the details matter potentially for you. Yeah. You probably never want to, so for all the Spring users, um, except if you want to migrate your entire app as it exists today to using only the standard, you probably shouldn't mix the, the two approaches. They're going to be very confusing. Um, so probably I, I, I would avoid doing that. All right, so cache managers. The, the way that, that you get to a cache manager to do something in JSON 107 is by using this caching type um, that lets you retrieve caching providers. In this case, we're only looking at one. Um, so the way that the, 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 the spec works is um, you actually put the, the Java X cache API on your class path. You put a implementer on the class path. So I'll try to not, I'm probably going to forget some. But as of today, the, the, the spec is being implemented by Oracle Coherence, Azelcast, Infinispan, Apache Ignite. I can't remember that. 
I, I, I know there's some work going on, so, so I could be wrong. You can go to the jcp.org website and, and see uh, who implements that. EH cache, obviously, so the 2x line, there's a wrapper, and then in the 3 line that we'll look at, um, it's, it's totally native support. Yeah. Uh, but you, you can go to the um, jcp.org website, and actually the, the page is updated to contain like all the implementer that pass the TCK. So you just put this implementer's jar on the uh, on the class path, and um, and using the caching get caching provider static method, you get to a caching provider that lets you access cache managers. Um, so there is this concept of a sort of a default one that means something, and um, the the caching provider is actually. That does a couple of things. So it is a repository for cache managers, um, identified based on URL and class loader pairs. Um, oh, that's what I had there. So, so it does that on top of providing you the, um, the abstraction to whatever implementer you have. Um, I would still recommend that you inject what has to be injected wherever it needs to be injected. <laughs> And don't use your caching provider as a mean to get to your to your cache manager. Yeah. That's probably not a good idea. And but you probably want to inject caches, as we will see, not even managers. Right. So the cache manager itself it manages the lifecycle uh, of caches, i.e., creating and destroying them. Uh, it also acts again as a repository of named cache instances, so that when you create a cache, you give it a name. And then you can get it back through the cache manager by just asking for that cache again, just providing the name. It manages the, the two um, MX beans that I talked about. And uh, it has this method that's called unwrap. Uh, anybody else knows this method maybe from JPA? All right, so what this method lets you do is you pass it a, like a type probably an imp implementer specific type, and it actually lets you unwrap um, what's underneath at some point that matches the, 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 um, the type that you passed in. So in the case of EHCache, for instance, this is how you can get to the full power of EHCache by just calling unwrap, and you get the EHCache cache type back that lets you do everything that EHCache lets you do. That's it. So that's 107. So that's setting the stage um, for, um, I guess, what we call the theory part um, and explaining what's available today, generally, in the Java world with that um, GSR 107 um, spec. Um, any questions so far? We'll be looking at code soon, so yeah. it's going to get confusing. So let's go into patterns. That first pattern should be familiar to most of you guys. So we're going to work cache aside. So I have my application square thingy. I have my cloudy cache somewhere, and then a database. I'm just going to take that as the basic example. Um, and what happens when I'm actually missing? So it means my application always try to get stuff out of the cache. It's faster. Nothing's there. So I have to go to the database get the result back. Don't forget to populate the cache, otherwise the next guy has the same problem. That's pretty basic. So that's why it's called cache aside, because it's still the application doing the switch between using the cache, using the database, using the cache, using the database. And obviously, a hit is pretty simple. Um, my application goes to the cache. The cache at the value returns it. That's it. I'm done. I assume that what I get is what I should return to the user or to the business process that needs that data. So pretty simple. Let's see that in practice. And he called me the manager, so he's going to be the coder today. Why today? <laughs> All right. Because I have to pretend a little bit. All right. So, um, so I'll, I'll use a, 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 a not entirely faked up, but pretty faked up app. Um, to, uh, to demo this. Um, so it's a simple online e-commerce website, nothing really fancy. Um, 
and I can actually look at things. Uh, and, and yeah, and that's it. And I can buy those things and whatnot. Um, there, there are a couple of things that are of importance, uh, but I'll discuss them as, as I, as I explode with the code. So as somebody that really cares about trying to figure out where caching is best used, I'm going to try to have a look at how this application performs. So what I'll be using for that, oh, that's cool. That's one thing that I don't know how to do in present mode. All right, sorry. Actually, maybe present mode is maybe, oh yes, it is required. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna use this tool called Xrebel. Anybody knows about Xrebel? All right, so you'll see that demo in a sec. It comes from the guys for Zero Turnaround and are the guys that do JRebel. Anybody knows about JRebel? All right, a bunch of people, that's good. That's good. I'm nowhere affiliated with those guys. I'm not really sure why I'm talking about them. Maybe because their stuff actually works. And I realize... It's not like your app. No, no, unlike my <laughs> app. <laughs> okay. I didn't say anything. Sorry, I'm doing things twice, hopefully. Because I need to run this thing. So what Xrebel does is pretty easy. I just add a, a VM parameter to my app saying it that um, it needs to attach an agent. And, uh, and I start my app. It's gonna, it's gonna give me an additional view on two things as soon as it starts up. Still Java, right? So it's slow. Ouch. <laughs> All right. So it gives me this 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 thing on the side there. You guys see that? It's not really easily readable, but we can see that we get some some fair some fair responses. So we see these are JSPs. This is high end technology, JSPs. <coughs> um, so obviously they need to be compiled first thing and so forth. But you do see that the rendering time there is 1.7 milliseconds, so that's not too bad. We're all very happy. So let's surf this website a little bit. So again, same thing. This was long, but probably because, yeah, again, compiling JSPs. This takes a little longer. Let's take a look at this guy here. All right, this took much longer. Let's rerun this. So now it's really compiled. We're down to half a second to actually get this done. So this is where now Xrebel is really cool because it lets me, like, from looking at this, I know directly where the problem is. And you're all going to be very surprised to hear that the problem is, so our page rendered in 543 milliseconds, and it spent 527 milliseconds in the database. Who uses a database in production? You crazy people, don't you see? It's causing all of our problems. And it makes our application not as responsive as we, as we want, it, want it to be. So all right, so I'll look at things. Who wrote that crap? This is why it takes forever. Anyways, we do see that there is a query here that just takes forever to run. And we can actually see, so it's this table here. All right, we're actually doing two lookups. So what goes on here is we have a table that has the, um, I'm not sure whether that was really readable, but has the, um, the, the additional pictures here for each product that are being looked up, and that takes forever. Uh, this is all canned. The reason it takes forever is because I populated this table with half a million rows for no added value other than to make the darn thing slow. So we could end this presentation by just saying, don't do stupid stuff like that, and you have no problems to solve. Yeah. So but but I have a presentation to give. Yeah, exactly. So we have a presentation to give. So no, we will not add an index to solve that. Yeah, we that, will instead that, that would, add a cache. Exactly. It is not indexed. <laughs> OK? So don't do lesson this at one, home. don't do stupid stuff like that. Yeah. I can. I'm an idiot, so I can do those things. All right, so cool. So, no, not cool, because I actually have forgotten where I'm supposed to look at things. So, as you can see, so it instrumented everything. Can you, can you guys read that at all? 
in the back. Oh, yeah, sorry. So it says yeah. get, yeah, get designs for collection. All right, so this is being, uh, all right, obviously the time is on this end. <laughs> Did I say it's an awesome tool? I meant it. So anyways, so this is where things go south, right? And it's in get designs for collection, sign my design DAO, because you always want to have DAOs. All right, so, whoops, sorry. So let's, oh, look at this, it's here. Uh, get designs for collection with three else. All right. Anyways, so that's what we have. So let's try to do this whole this whole caching aside thing that Louis talked about. As you can see, this is totally not production code. Never do anything stupid like I'm doing here, like sharing your collection uh, your connection to your database across multiple threads. This is a very bad idea. This is a website that can be used by exactly one user at a time as of now. <laughs> It's a, it's a local host version of right. who wrote who writes stuff like that <laughs> all right so i should have oh that's a good start i thought i was really sure i added the hmm all right anyways here's what i do right i'm adding my jcash stuff and my provider I'm not going to look at anything fancy with this right now. I'm just going to look at the JSA 107 stuff. See how that works. Now, for some reason, though, it is not on the class path. All right, that's a good start. I've been told you're supposed to kill kittens so that demos work, <laughs> but like everyone, I like kittens, so obviously I didn't kill any. Maybe I should have. Did I say that? I don't know. Not this All right. So that's a slight problem. All right. There goes my bonus this year. I'm coding <laughs> in front of a manager, and I just look like. Oh, don't worry. It's recorded full. anyway. So. None of this is on the class path. It might just. Reimport. Yeah, I just did that. Yeah, I'm not sure why it complains about 3.0 snapshot not being there, because it is there, but that's ju just uh, the implementation. Re the front, just to be sure. What? Reimport the front stuff also. Oh, you, you, are you say it's not reimporting everything when I do that? I don't know. All right, that's very bad, very bad, very bad. I always test demos last minute, and I did all of that, and none of that. It's there. It's what? Services. Domain. Do you have it in the domain? But this is not where it is. I'm right here. Oh, this is going to be really problematic if I don't <laughs> get to this type. So, yeah, help me here. Say something smart. While he's trying to figure that out. What the heck? Um, the one thing you'll see with cache aside is immediately it becomes your responsibility to maintain everything, like proper concurrency between multiple threads. So one, one of the clear drawbacks from cache aside is when you hit the cache, let's say at application startup, and you've got plenty of internal processes wanting to load that all uh, reference data from your database, which is usually a good caching candidate. And you've got all these threads hitting the same cache at the same time, or nearly the same time. In a cache aside model, most of them will just go, oh crap, cache is empty, let's go load the database. Next one, oh crap, cache is empty, let's go load the database. Oh crap, cache is empty, and for a number of threads. And so you end up populating the cache in the end, but you probably went to the database way too, more, way too many times. And if you don't want to do that when you're in a cache aside model, it's kind of re your responsibility to have some kind of locking or exclusion in front of the cache to make sure that one, while, while one guy is waiting for the cache entry to be populated, you don't have all the other guys also doing work. Yes, they're all waiting, but at least you're making the database work only one time. So that's, that's the kind of trade-off you have to, to, to look for. Um, the next thing is that since your cache aside, Again, when you write to the database, you need to do something about the cache. 
So it's not only the readers that need to know about the cache, it's also the writers, because if you modify the data in the database, you should probably go invalidate that cache, <laughs> or update that cache, depending on what you want. Um, and so that's, again, in a cache-aside scenario, up to you. It becomes your responsibility to make sure... It's still Google's fault. It's still not... It's still unhappy? It's not happy. It's all Google's fault. They have an old version. So anybody using Google App Engine here? You can see I am. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so the, I, I, the, the problem being that actually they ship with with an old version of the spec. And so this is why it's not finding any of this. This is really annoying. OK, so I'm, not, I'm, go, I'm still going to do this um, some other way. And what I'll do is I'll just use, I'll just use this module, whatever. You won't see the thing running, but the, the important thing is, I guess, the code. That, that's what I want to showcase. Really sorry about this. I was so sure this would be very slick. Yep. Oh. oh, you think so? Did I screw up my, there is an error. I, I saw that it's complaining about, um, let's open a new window if that doesn't work. Man, are we lucky? So there goes your, the pause, so there will be no <laughs> break. <laughs> this is what happens when the idiot in front can't prepare his things properly. So you're saying I screwed up my palm. I'm not sure why it even complains about that. I mean, this should find ahead. this. See if there is something else there. Oh, failed read descriptor. We don't care about that. No, that's not it. That's just. Um, exactly. So the well, reason he's well, using snapshot, snapshot is because EHCache 3 is under active development. Um, and while we released Milestone 3, um, a while back, when was that? Um, just after, during um, Spring to GX in the US, so um, mid-September, Milestone 3 of EHCache 3 went out at that point. Whoever had the answer to this, okay. I owe you like, I don't know, 20 beers or something? And, and so, let's be honest, the reason he's using Snapshot is because Milestone 3 has a number of issues that were discovered after. Man, that's bad. <laughs> so wait for Milestone 4 or use Snapshots from the Sonotype Snapshot repo. Uh, Milestone 4 should be out um, end of next week, something like that. That's the current plan. Um, we screwed up concurrency in some places. That's not bad. <laughs> Yeah. Could this be like, is this code I wrote? I guess <coughs> so. Yeah, OK, there we are. Yeah, which, which got fixed, then whatever. So okay. if, you, if you want, at any point, like input on your Maven project files, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty pathetic. All right, now I'm coding this like full speed. All right, so this is what I was just explaining, right? So I'm getting the caching provider. I'm getting the first one that it finds on the class path. Um, because there could be multiple ones, right? Yeah. You can right. specify the name. You can, again, pass in the class loader, which enables all of that to work in an OSGI environment if you're crazy enough to do that. Uh, although you'll need to wait for the first revision of the spec, because it's missing a few exports. Right. Um, so, so this will only work if there is a single provider on the class path. Otherwise, it will throw an exception. And so now what I can do is I can just, <laughs> all right, looks like. That's the old one. That's the old one again, right? This is crazy. OK, I, so as you can see, this is really using the stuff from the App Engine the, that you get from App Engine. And that's all the old API. I'm not sure if they will ever update to the new one. But it's OK, so this is really not working out. Sorry about this. But the good news is I can still show how this works in here. Let's just open. 
I think I, I don't I don't think it's a, it's it's not a um, transitive dependency. I think they actually like really bundle it inside the the SDK thing. And I, I prepared all of this uh, like an hour ago, right over there. That's uh, a secret. Well, I think it shows now. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. <laughs> if if I would have spent lo much longer on this, I would be really pathetic, which I could be. Uh, but the um, so so yeah, it's bundled in like really in in the whole thing. So I, I can't exclude the the whole uh, thing anyways neither because if I do. Um, then there is other stuff that will not work then. Because actually the app was, at some point I was maybe crazy enough to say, all right, let's deploy this onto Google App Engine and make it run like for real. Oops, sorry, wrong move. But I don't think that's, that would have been any smart given what you see right now. So I'm sure there is somewhere where I can write some code Just in there. Just getting started. Sorry? Oh, yeah. And... Obviously, we didn't name this. Execute. Oh. You know the name of the method that shows the whole thing? It's not there. All right. Not what are you looking for? So the stuff? It's just one place where I can write a test. Here I can write a test. I want to show the, the thing nonetheless. So caching, get the caching provider. From the caching provider, I get the default cache manager. What this means is totally dependent on the um, on, on the implementation that you use. There is actually more to this. So if you look at this, this has something like default class loader, uh, caching, get, get default URL also there should be. Get default URI. And actually, this method here delegates to the one that takes all like the, the three the things, right? The defaults. And so, so you can somewhat look into what the provider is doing, or at least what the semantic of what the provider is doing should be, um, and maybe act on this, or I don't know exactly. But anyways, here we're just getting a cache manager. And now I can actually create a cache. Yay, we're there. And um, whatever, right? This was the designs things. Um, and here come interesting New stuff. Yeah. So we're sticking to only um, to only um, one of seven types here, right? And so this creates me my cache. So now I've got a cache in which I can use things. I'm going to mention one thing about the spec, because I think it is very important. Um, it has to do with type inference. Uh, so let's say I would do this here, and then now uh, I need some type here. Give me something. So Tom. it just put strings again. Everything string. can be okay, presented right. as a string. Exactly. That's why two string is for, no? Right? All right. So if I do this, all right. So on, I'm, I'm creating mutable configuration that is of type string string, where it's string is the key and string for the value. And then I create a cache, and, and the typing on my cache is all inferred from this type here. Now, the, we're, we're actually supposed to enforce proper type safety here. So what, what do I mean by this? So obviously, like the, any, any developer could actually do this, right? And designs. Um, right, then you see put uh, one L new object. Okay, so now I got something that is not keyed by a string, and that is actually well. Actually, I can do something not really evil, string. like, like yeah. really evil. I could do this. Right, so it's it's pro the, the key type is proper, but the object uh, the value type isn't proper, and well, let's let's ask. What would you what would you expect from that code? What do you want as a developer working with a type specific cache? Exception. Okay. Compilation error, probably even better. But there you went to the erased, found to the uh, non-generic type. So yeah, I that's guess. fair that it's not a compiler error. But the exception sounds fair, yes. Right, and that's certainly what, what 
each cache belief should happen, and um, that's certainly what we do. Now the problem is, if I run this code using each cache, it will actually not throw. And it is because of something very nasty, and I think the spec is a, has actually boxed itself in the corner because I don't think this can be fixed without breaking backwards compatibility, and obviously you can't do that as part of the spec. So it all has to do with this constructor here. So actually, JSA 107 gives me, as an implementer, the, the, the option to actually record exactly what the key and what the value types are so that I can protect the cache. And this can, this, the, 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 this can be very powerful because, so yes, there is this code that just effectively abused the thing. You just hand the guy who wrote that down, in this case me, and you fire him. <coughs> Carving. But yeah, I know. Uh, we'll, we'll have to talk about that. I'll buy you beer too or something. But the, it, it actually is more subtle, right? So for, let's say for a distributed cache, where actually the cache lifespan is, is bigger than, 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 than the VM lifespan, right? So let's say you do an upgrade of your application and that there is a good reason to actually change types, but somebody forgets to nuke the cache on the back end so, so that it still has all value in there, right? So, so it could happen. And this is why the type safety is really important. This is why it's part of the spec that actually there is a get value type here that actually would protect me. But Again, because of this, those two lines of code and erasure. So always make sure that you do this. That's the type stuff, I think it is, right? Yeah. All right. So who thinks that's a valid candidate for constructor argument? Like mandatory one? Yeah. But that's what he's saying about not being able to do it without breaking backwards compatibility. That's the Java world. I mean, okay. GSR 107 spec has a no arc constructor on that mutable configuration. You should never use it. Um, some revision may add the other constructor, but removing the one that takes no arguments, that's a backward breaking change. Okay. So it's there. So pay attention. So anybody actually started using uh, GSR 107 already? All right. Uh, and People looked into using it. Uh, if that was like a standard option offered by whatever framework you're using, would you just <coughs> use that instead of specific caching APIs, or you still believe you need specific stuff? Uh, we need specific prob stuff that's not covered by the spec. Yeah. But the problem, I only saw a couple of hands going up of yeah. people like that looked so into it. Probably so too too far. So it all depends. But but we'll show like as we go. Uh, and if I get to write more code ever <laughs> in this company, uh, we'll show you uh, more uh, what's, what's in the spec and what's outside of the spec. All right, so now I'm here, right? And I can actually do my put of whatever the key is. So what I had here, right? So that's the stuff that will never work, very bad. But right, I had my des uh, right, just, design just for the collection. Just field and show the code just around the cache. Can't you do that? Uh, yeah. Well, that's not even working. No, that should work. Whatever. So let's assume the code he wrote in that other project is the one that created that cache. <laughs> and so it can then be used here. Always listen to specialists when you need advice. <laughs> Yeah, that covered. Um, so, all right, so this is where we do the lookup. The one that's really cost is this one here. Um, but uh, so what we can now do is just cache that put, and I think I have a key. So the key is actually what's being passed to the method, right? And just put the designs in, right? So now they're there, and all I need to do now at the beginning of my method call, let's just do the cache that get key. That returns me, in this case, object. And if oh different than null, I just return the value, right? So again, this would be properly typed if it, this yeah. would be a real thing. Sadly enough, it's not. Uh, uh, is it true what I'm saying? Um, right, uh, it's not. Okay, so there you go. So just 
we make a blind cast because we're just crazy like that. And that's what we do. Now, so this is cache aside, right? I go to the cache, I go check whether it's there. If it's there, I return whatever is there. If it's not, I go to, uh, like, to my system of record, like do all those crazy computations and put the thing in. Yeah, and clearly what you see from there is that we're really wrapping the business code with these cache statements. So that's one clear explanation for why it's provided by frameworks like the Spring abstraction. Right. When it does, when you annotate your method, it's actually going to create a proxy that's going to do exactly that. Look in the cache. If nothing, invoke your method, cache the result, return. Right. Look in the cache if they return. Um, now, the problem is with this approach um, that if two threads come around, I have two threads that go go check in the cache, no, it's not there. They both go hit the system of record, populate the data, and they both put the thing in the cache. That's a downside. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's one of the downsides I was explaining. Um, All right, when I was that. looking very... Yeah, when you were looking busy. That's right, trying to fix this, yeah. Right, which, oh man, sorry. <laughs> so, I talked a bit about these during the, the demo. Um, cache then? aside is the simpler cache pattern. It's the solution you see most out there, like Spring, Play, Grails, all these framework will offer you cache aside semantics when, when you've got that annotation. Um, none of them, for example, protects you against hitting multiple times the business method, the database load, or whatever. They don't lock, they don't exclude. It's just, if it's in the cache, I'm going to load from the cache. If it's not in the cache, I'm going to execute my method, potentially populate my cache multiple times with hopefully the same result, but who knows? So that's one thing. Um, again, integration, most often based on annotation, because as you've seen, the code is so uninteresting and so generic that, yeah, it's really a really good pattern for um, interception and stuff like that. That's the tricky bit in cache aside. Getting the concurrency and or atomicity right is not cool. I mean, under high heavy load, your spring caching solution could end up caching a stale result. It all depends who wins in thread scheduling. Like you've got two threads hitting the database, one reads most recent results, the other one was first and read slightly out of date results. But in the end, the ones that put the one that puts last in the cache is that second thread with the slightly outdated values. And suddenly, for your expiry time, you've got slightly outdated values in that cache. If you don't believe me, just put a system under load. It will happen to you eventually. And, and also, um, same thing for the um, atomicity. <coughs> what do you do? Even worse if you're running your own, because if you start trying to do that kind of stuff, the code can get pretty hairy pretty fast, and you can like shoot yourself in the foot easily. So it's, again, it's all about um, bonus pros and cons. What do, you, what do you need? What are your needs? Um, how important is that? And of course, like we said, like Alex said, you'll probably do multiple real invocations when you're warming up that cache. Depending on how costly this is, it could be pretty bad. You know, you put caching in your app, it works fine in dev, you go to prod, you put caching in your app and the database crashes while the app is loading. So, what? Yeah, because you added that nice feature of pre-warming all the caches at the startup, which sounded like a good idea when you had 10 records in that dev database. And with the millions in production, it's causing a little bit of delay and potentially crashing stuff or overloading the database because suddenly all these calls happening nearly in parallel become a problem. You kind of reproduced at startup the load for which you try to add caching to resolve. Yeah. Now, one more item, because yeah. Hibernate has... So. Who, who knows about Hibernate? Who uses Hibernate? All right. 
Java Hibernate is an object to relational mapping tool, right? That lets you map plain Java objects to tables in your database, to put it simply. So small quiz. I'm loading boat one. I'm loading boat two. Well, it's another ref, right? It's the same ID. But it's the same ID. So is this true or is, who, who believes that this is true? Who believes that this is false? Who believes he wants a break? All the rest of you. <laughs> All right. So as it turns out, this will be true because this is what you get. Um, the session is effectively the first level cache. I, it will, it, the, state, the session is itself stateful. Uh, yeah, obviously I didn't mention this. There is a stateless session, but this is not the one. Um, so the session you get by default is stateful, and it will just remember. It gives you, like, uh, I think it's even part of the JPS spec itself, then it gives you, like, this object identity <coughs> contract, right? This boat 27 uh, will just give you the same instance every time. Which, I guess, makes sense when you think about it, right? Because, like, it, I could mutate it as I go within the same transaction I want. Same kind of visibility and so forth. Like, trying to maintain this with multiple instances would be kind of crazy. Um, okay. So, Hibernate comes with a second level cache. And that one is, is pretty different. So, who uses Hibernate second level cache? people. So that one is different in the sense that it doesn't store objects. A bunch of people actually believe it does, but it doesn't. So if I, if I use Hibernate to cache my, um, my boats, it will actually store a dehydrated version of, of the boat instance, i.e. like let's say all the row fields, right? And that it will use that data like as it gets the data, as if it would get that data from 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 the database, right, and reuse that to rebuild um, a new boat instance when need be. So that all of a sudden, that stuff effectively becomes thread safe, which is a non-neglectable point. Um, it it has this uh, Hibernate cache use structured entries thing that lets you actually store stuff as uh, as a map, so that it, that's useful if you want to debug. Uh, things that maybe don't work the way that you believe they should and involve caching. Make sure you never go in production with that though because this is not the smartest way to do the caching. So it comes with four strategies. There is the read-only one that as the name says is for data that's read-only. It will not even allow you to actually update anything in there so really make sure. Th this one's useful so that you don't have any consistency concerns and things like that, right? So it's, it makes, the, from a caching topology perspective, it makes it much simpler. There is read-write that um, does something around the um, atomicity and concurrency on on a, an entry that's currently being mutated. So that what it'll do, it, it'll, in quotes, soft lock the entry in the cache. And so that if another thread tries to look at something that is currently in the process of being updated, right, the cache is going to pretend that data is not there. So that Hibernate goes down to your system of record to try to resolve what is the value to be handed out which then depends on the transaction isolation level and so forth um, that, that you configure to your database and or transaction um, to apply. Um, it has an, another one that's called non-strict that, that is slightly sl simpler, but, but blows a race wider to actually have things stale in there longer. Um, the, the non-strict read-write also only populates on load, while the read-write also and and while the read-write populates on an update. So what I mean by this is that when there is an update and you use the non-strict read-write, it acts as an invalidation. It actually tells the cache whatever you think you knew isn't good anymore. That entry gets dropped and will only get repopulated when when a load happens. And finally, has the transaction one that requires you to have an XA cache, uh, a JTA transaction manager in the picture and everything. And this is where I'm actually missing a bullet point. And um, when I mentioned earlier that actually maintaining your cache could actually be more costly 
than, than you think it may be, so that in the end, actually, the cache is harmful. Uh, anybody knows about the query cache in Hibernate? All right. So the query cache tries to cache the result of given queries. Uh, when I say query, not like the load that I just showed by ID, but like any query. And, and the way it works is that it knows what tables are involved in resolving the query. And it knows when those tables were last updated. And, and so when it has a result, it actually goes check the timestamp of that given result against when the table involved in resolving that query were last touched. If they weren't touched since the result was cached, it returns that. If, if not, then it pretends it's a miss and validates the whole thing and goes down. And maintaining this timestamp cache or whatnot that actually holds like the name of the table to the actual timestamp when it was last mutated is something that can be pretty, pretty expensive. Certainly in, in systems that are highly mutative, right? Um, and it's, if, if you're using the, people think, you know, the, when people start using caching in Hibernate, they just turn everything on. It must be good, it has caching in the name. <laughs> you, again, going back to what we said earlier, you want to measure, and you want to measure, in, in order to know whether you're doing any better, you need to measure after the fact as well, right? Yeah. So be sure to use this wisely. All right. So that's actually, the, the Hibernate case is actually a nice segue into cache through use cases, because what you effectively get is there is a cache. Actually, let me interrupt you. Okay. Sh should we take a break for a little? I was coming there. Oh, so man. It's so the magic. It's the nice so segue to ahead. cache through. And so I think it's going to be interesting that we hit the more advanced caching patterns after taking a short break. So let's say. 25? 25 minutes? Yeah. So that leaves us 10 past 3. Yeah. I can hear it in. All right, let's do that. Thanks, see you. Hopefully. Um, before moving forward, a um, couple of interesting questions that were asked during the break. Um, and I, I think it's worth repeating the answers to these questions. So the first one was, what exactly does a cache require from your Java objects? So the stuff you place into the cache. Um, first of all, you remember we said it's a data structure. So proper equals an hash code implementation. Um, you'll find some variants of a concurrent hash map underneath each cache implementation. So a good hash code that spreads well um, makes a lot of sense. Um, also, you probably want to favor, and certainly for the key immutable objects, just to be safe. Um, it's also a good idea for the value if you can afford it. Um, we, I, I recently had a question on the mailing list about, oh, I don't understand. I'm mutating the object, and the cache doesn't notice. Yeah, it's not a magic data structure. So if you have an entry, you change it, and you're relying on listeners, yes, you will need to re-put it again um, in order to be notified of the change. So that's one thing. The other on, on, on what you put in there, um, um, also like, um, so if you put mute, mutable state in your cache, um, so w we'll look at exactly what it means in terms of topologies and whatnot further down the path. But the um, know that the stuff that you put in there will be touched by multiple threads, right? Uh, so there is a happens before relationship when you actually put and get things out of the cache, like because of the data structure like providing you with that. But if I get something from a cache and I start mutating it while somebody else holds a reference to that object, like you're on your own, right? It, it's up to you to actually make it so that this code is threat safe, either in terms of visibility or mutability. And one very common mistake um, that I see being done is actually putting, again, talking about Hibernate, like JPA entities directly in a cache. While it is feasible to do that, you probably need to give this really, really careful thoughts 
uh, you never want a managed entity be in there, right? One that's currently still attached to a, oh crap, what's it called in JPA wording? The entity manager, which in turn relates to um, a JDBC connection underneath and so forth, right? The, none of those structures are meant to be used by, concurrently by multiple threads. So even if you make your, your domain thread safe, right, the, 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 like, <coughs> The type that you get is actually not your type, right? It's it's a it's it's a proxy that yeah. does, for instance, the lazy loading of a of a collection in the back, right? You do you don't want to have that code be executed by multiple threads. This is a recipe for disaster. So that's so that's clearly one one serious attention point. Um, the other question was about eviction policies. So. Depending on the cache implementation, you may have multiple eviction policies available. Um, let's be honest, as soon as you have a really large cache, it's all a lie, because if you want like first in, first out, that means the cache has to keep a total ordering, um, which may or may not be a good idea depending on the implementation. Um, least frequently used. Do you really want to find the least frequently used object over a million one when we have to evict? Because usually eviction means that your system is under load. So that's not the moment where you want um, latency to increase because we try to evict the least frequently used object. So while they might sound like a good idea to tweak, um, you really want to have to care as little as you can and let the cache handle that for you, um, hopefully in a smart way, obviously. But that's, that's clearly one thing. And again. When you, while you're doing testing with 10 objects, it makes sense because you want that one to be evicted. But think real. Think how many objects you end up having in the cache and really what happens. And sure, if you're storing 20 object max, then maybe the eviction policy setting makes a lot of sense for you. But if you're storing a million objects, probably doesn't care a lot. So that were the two questions. And third, you fixed the deal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd forgotten. We had to do that. I mean, come on. So I can actually show you the whole thing. So actually, the way that I fix it is by not using the JSON 107 API. But I don't, I don't think you will really be able to tell. So what I'm doing here are those couple of lines that actually uh, build the, um, the cache manager and the cache inside this DAO, which is probably not the right place to do this. But anyways. Architecture is totally overrated. And I'm generally a very sarcastic person. Sorry about that. Uh, so, and here is the whole code, right? So um, that hasn't changed. Um, actually, I don't even need this. I'm an idiot. Right, on my list. Oh, yeah, I still have to cast it because of the generate type on the value type itself. Uh, but anyways, so I return my whole thing, and that's the put. And maybe it's still even running, actually. No, it is not running anymore yet. No. All right, so let's run this. You know, like this very first time you, you write in a new language, and you actually get the compiler to be <laughs> not yelling at you. That's sort of the excitement I'm in right now. I managed to put something in the cache and retrieve it back, <laughs> demo this to you. <laughs> All right, so Oops. first thing uh, here, All right. Whoa, oh yeah. So I still get my six database hits and it's all very slow. This accounts for the compiling, but now if I re-hit the whole thing, I only get three hits to uh, to my database, and you can see the late the latency really got down now, right? My request is being served much much faster than the half a second that we had before. So, like somebody tweeted, you fix the latency problem, and now you have to fix all the invalidation, consistency, and whatever problems you introduced by using a cache. Yeah. So, um, Hibernate was a nice segue into cache through because that's actually how you experience caching in Hibernate. It's not even like you have to deal with annotation or anything. It's the impression that 
Hibernate talks to your cache, and if it can't find the stuff in the cache, it talks to the database. And that's exactly what the cache through pattern is. So when I miss on a cache through pattern, my application is talking to my cache, nothing else. The cache says, don't have the data. I am going to fetch it from the database. So it becomes the cache responsibility to populate the entry. Get the results back, installs it in the cache, returns to the application. That's like basic cache through. What most implementation will give you, of course, is that only one thread actually goes to the database when multiple hit the same key and at the same time. Anybody using Guava? And obviously, the, they have some, it's, the caching stuff is inside the Guava library, yeah, right? Yeah. And also, I wasn't sure. So this is how Guava does cache population, effectively, right? You, you do your get, and you provide the function that is to supply the value if the value is not there. And I, I think you have a way to do it cache aside, but you have to jump yeah. through hoops. They really want you to think cache through because of all these multiple threads doing right. the load and stuff. Right. Because in, then in that case, only the one that gets to effectively get to whatever write lock is required to up install this mapping will be the one populating. And so, of course, once you have the value in the cache, it's just the same. You're talking to the cache. So there is one thing that's a m big, big difference from the cache aside model. Your application no longer talks to the database. It just talks to the cache. The cache becomes, conceptually, the system of record. Which is very similar to what you get uh, from the CPU stuff that we, we had a look before, right? You, you do, you get, and it actually hits the L1 cache, and if that, that line is missing, then it's going to go fetch it from er wherever it needs, right? Sort of transparent. So that was like read through, but you may also want to have write through, which when you think about it actually most often makes sense. If you have writable data um, and you're already doing everything cache through, read through, you probably won't write through. So what does that mean? Well, it means that you're putting in the cache this time, your application updated something on its own, and it puts to the cache. The cache goes right to the database, and then returns. So again, no database interaction from the application's point of view. The cache, both for read and write operation, really becomes, again, conceptually, I'm insisting on that, because it's still a cache, it can still evict, et cetera, et cetera, but conceptually, that's your system of record. You only see one thing, one API. So clearly, it simplifies a lot of the um, complexities we associated with cache aside. And so again. Again, I'm going to fail. No, no. <laughs> All right. So I was <coughs> applying to demo this. So what is it that we mean? I guess I have a, so the app here, and demo this with this, actually shows like there is sort of this page counter thing that tells you like, all right, this thing had so many views. So we still have this when we look this code here, I guess. There is something that goes and does the update of things, right? So that's E write. That happens. But let's first focus on reading. What does it mean? So effectively what I want is all this code here. Right. Where is it? All this code effectively to happen here automatically. Okay? That's what we want to do. So that effectively, <laughs> I actually never put, and all I do is a get on my cache. So how do we do this? Uh, that's not the way, obviously, I plan to demo this, so that's going to be cool. So, yeah, one trick uh, while he's doing that. Um, the way we got the demo working, so it was indeed because of the old version of the non-final GSR 107 being in the Google App Engine jars. Um, and so the way we're doing it is we're just going directly with the EHCache 3 API. 
And obviously now Which means also that what you're seeing here could change because it's not released yet. Right. So here is an example of some, well, okay. Maybe not a good example. So what we do actually is we provide an implementation of this cache loader writer. And um, so it, it's, it's user supplied code, right? That will define how to load a given key and return the value to be installed. And then there are variances of that of like, well, load all. In the case there are multiple entries that are the neat populating. And there are the writers, the writer methods like write, write all, and the delete, delete all, right? And that lets you do those things. So obviously a load refers to a get, a write refers to a put amongst other things, and a delete maps to remove um, of some kind. Um, when I say of some kind, it's because there are multiple ways that you can actually delete things, right? So yeah, clearly one thing you see here is that you have a reduced set of operations to deal with. It's not like the full power of what you can do with SQL if your database is relational in the back. So that needs adaptation. You need to think in that. And also, very explicitly, this doesn't map one-to-one -one with the cache operations. Because depending on what the cache does, it could have a different meaning for what needs to happen on the system of record. OK. So I'm still with the um, with each cache 3 milestone 3, because we actually just introduced some changes into how we make it easy or not for somebody to um, to to register a um, a cache loader writer. All right, so th th there is one big difference in the way that each cache three looks at this and uh, JSR one hundred and seven looks at this. Um, JSR one hundred and seven looks at this in two different, like it, it addresses the problem in, in like from sort of two ends. There is a cache loader and there is a cache writer. There are two separate types, two separate interfaces. Most probably you're gonna implement those on, on, on the same concrete type, because um, I guess it makes sense, right? Whatever knows how to read something probably also best knows how to write it. Um, in each cache three, what we decided is we only have a single type for this. Uh, it's a cache loader writer, and it does both. Um, if you are in a use case where you never want the data, for instance, to be updated, all power to you to have those methods throw if they're invoked, and you make sure that the mapping methods at your at your at your cache just don't, don't do anything, which could be a sensible thing. Uh, uh, sorry, the matching caching methods are never invoked. Um, that could be a sensible thing to do. Um, silently doing nothing in the case of a write, I really don't know what this means from a, yeah. from a use case perspective. If you have one, I'd love to hear it. Um, same being true, like if, if, you, if you do the sort of symmetric mapping onto the load, like something that never loads but knows how to write, I'm not really sure what this means. Why are you using a cache, really? I don't know. But, but anyways. Yeah, we, we, we found the, the drawbacks and the potential weird situation you could get yourself into by having the two APIs separated um, not worth um, you having to like make a few methods throw or implement extra methods and have something that indicates, at least in your testing, that something wrong is happening. Um, so. That's an opinionated API, I guess. Hmm. Uh, also, another big difference in the way that we do things oh, and yeah. that 107 does things is um, actually your cache here. So when I said it actually comes with a bunch of methods, amongst which like the replace method that you know from the current current map, right? And it comes with the same semantics. Um, so we got put if absent, for instance. So, some key. So everybody's clear with the semantics of these compare and swap methods? So, well, so the put if absent 
is going to, let's talk just about the cache use case and I'll let Alex then speak about the integration problem. But so a put if absent on the cache means that if there is no entry, install the mapping. If there is already a mapping, please give it to me. And so it's a way of having multiple threads trying to put the same key and only one wins. And you know which one, and you know which value was the first to make it in. Right. And that's so back to get. the integration issue. So if you're using your cache as a system of record, well, as if it was a system of record, right? It sits in front of, of your, in my case here, the database. What, the, just I want to seven decides that the put if absent will succeed if the value is not in the cache. Each cache, on the other end, even though it has the mode to be 107 compliant, right, and you can, um, you can, you can actually change the behavior that 107 should use, should you want to, but by default it is spec compliant, so it just does what the spec says, i.e. it will not go to a system of record. So that the put of absent will do a write to update something in your system of record in the case that it's not present in the cache. Which personally makes my head spin because I'm not really sure what this could possibly mean from an application perspective. Effectively, we're making a business decision on updating the system of record based on something not being in the cache, which by definition, the cache being a subset of the data that you have underneath, I'm not really sure what you can do with this. And, yeah, and also, Evicted. Right, because by definition, you don't know what the population of your cache is, right? Your cache should be the hot set of whatever data it's caching. The hot set will be more or less big depending on how much resources you decide to allocate to your cache, right? So something being hot or not being hot, I don't see how this is, has any business semantic. And so we discussed it for fun, but probably won't do it. So. Each cache three, when used as a GSI 107 provider, will be compliant with the spec, so it will not use the reader, the, the read method, to go see if the key actually exists in the system of record. Um, and you can turn it off by configuring each cache to say, oh, I want the each cache semantics, not the GSI 107 one. We discussed actually implementing a Volkswagen hack so that we would detect when we're running under CK and behave properly, and but then have yeah, the one that would do no harm to 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 the planet. Yeah, no, sure, right? no, it's nothing. Like harmless it's harmless hack, but it's and still when you run thing. outside of it, it runs differently. But we thought that's probably not cool. Shouldn't do that. You're right. We don't hate our users that much. <laughs> All right. So th the way that that I configure my cache to actually use such a cache to the writer is so we use the build pattern um, in order to. Um, generate stuff, um, well, to, to configure about anything in, in HCache 3. In the case of uh, JSR 107, it actually just, you just provide the instance to the... You provide a factory. Right, so it's up factory, to you what exactly. the factory does. Right. Can give directly an instance, can be a real factory that's going to build an object somehow. Um, Um, I can't type today. Class, my glue code. Implements cache loader writer of string to lists. Uh, so I need to implement all those methods here, right? So since I know what I'm doing, I'm slightly gonna cheat. And what I'm gonna do is this load. Just gonna make it return load no and fetch. How did I call this method from the S right? So what I'm doing is when load gets invoked, it's gonna go invoke this method that I just refactored previously that just does the load. And yeah, in the case of this, and that's it. So theoretically, <laughs> this is where now. Hopefully, I'm not wrong. This 
is all not tested on animals or whatever. But most importantly, this is all not tested. All right, so where was I here? So now I need to provide my glue code is what I call this guy, right? Class, all right, am I missing anything, Major? No, but yeah, let's see. All right. So now when we get to where was the method? Let's get here, right? Good design it should do the proper thing. Huh. Apparently, uh, I'm about uh, to cry. I, I got doubts about the building and the connection being there, but we'll see. Oh, yeah. and the connection being there. All right. Are you ready? <laughs> <coughs> oh, wait a sec. Maybe, wait, yeah. maybe that wasn't the problem, actually. No, no, it is a problem. Constructor. Okay, so this is all tested. So if you want me to write some code for your company, just come talk to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I, seriously, no, let's uh, do let's do like um, like it worked. I can no, do that. No, not make it work, but um, no, pretend that it worked. I can do. Yeah. What did I so say? we're currently developing EHCache three, and that's okay. the kind of stuff you miss out when you're doing the development because the dummy testing you do just works, and then you realize, oh crap, but I really need an object that already has its connection and everything. So passing in a class where I just get a constructor invoked is like, cool. Fuck yeah. No, but if it's static, then it doesn't yeah, get access to problem. the connection and his host. So he could make it public. Actually, and actually I can do it. You okay. can make it public, but that's not going to happen. Nothing's going to help. Yeah. It's, I need my... He needs his connection. Did I say stuff. something about architecture being overrated? Yeah. Crap. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. But then I need to move the method. Okay, I can do that. What? No. So, so, the, so this uh, is the kind of stuff, indeed, that you realize when you're really using Steam. the API. So we're still on the development, so help us try it out if you're interested in EHCache. Um, it should be better than 2x, um, but that kind of details could shoot us. And yes, one of the things that soon to be merged into um, master is exactly that. The ability for you to pass an instance of one of these companion objects of your cache instead of having to pass a constructor. Um, can I, I not do this? Can, I can, can do that. You can pass right? constructor parameters. I can, right? Yes. All right, so that's what I'm doing. Maybe not on milestone three, though. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's not fun. All right. <laughs> I can't remember when that made it in. Uh, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let's run this. No, what did I do wrong? Oh no, you need to go to. All right. Oh, man, I hate that this run thing goes away. We'll see if it's part of that thing or not. So, so you're seeing both the process of screwing live coding and realizing that the API you've designed are missing a few things. <laughs> <laughs> Exercise in humility. Mm. <laughs> and I'm going to be so... There you go. What? There we are. See? So we did mental more beer. I'm serious, right? Catch me at some point, no matter how old beer too. I do old beer, so I'll be paying. Um, so we're still hitting the thing, right? We're still hitting the system of record here, but um, but our method, I got, uh, maybe actually I can even use that. No, sorry, wrong window. Not you, you, here, so it all goes south, right? See, we executed the load, so, and it's all part of, of loading my, um, so my find by key, no, that's a collection service then, right here. Get designs for collection, right? Which we do agree. And designs for collection just hits the cache. Yep. So that cache, that's cached through for you. Right. I can, hmm. 
Right? No, let, let's keep it like that for now. We'll yeah. do a write yeah. in the next thing. Yeah. And I'll swear I'll screw it up. There needs to be some kind of lead thing here, right? Yeah, some yeah, yeah. kind of fil rouge that I keep Which through the whole thing. One? Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Good night. So that's another successful demo. It worked faster. Better. <laughs> so some conclusions on that on that pattern. Um, who has ever used that pattern? Okay, deployed in production. Cool. And you did much better than me, I'm sure. <laughs> it took months. <laughs> um, so clearly, when you want to move to cash through, it's not for free. Um, you have to model and change your abstractions because you're no longer talking to a database and then talking to the cache on the side. You're now talking to a caching API for everything that are related. So while possible, it requires some work. And that's the first thing. Viewing the full system of record through the cache may not be easy, but guess what? Like we said at the beginning, you probably want to have caching only where it counts. And so it doesn't mean that you have to do all your data access through the cache, just where it's important. Unless the implementation is broken, but then it's not exactly your problem completely, it should provide better guarantee and consistency. Um, for example, no invalidation anymore. Since you're writing to the system of record through the cache, the cache should be consistent with whatever sits in the database. Um, of course, this still falls apart if you have some external services modifying your data. You still need to do something special in that case. Uh, who, who has that, by the way? Yeah. Like, who, who, who's using a cache and has some other system directly yeah. connecting to your database and screwing up things? And writing to it. Oh, Yay! The, the fun of enterprise development. <laughs> <laughs> architecture, totally overrated. But there is still one thing that should have been pretty clear when we looked at the diagram, the small animations and stuff, is that the cost of writing is paid by the thread which, which put in the cache. Since you're waiting for the write to happen on the database before returning. And that may not always be what you want. Because suddenly, your supposedly fast temporary data structure becomes a slow proxy of the database. Which that kind of conflicts with why you added a cache in the first place. Right, which again depends on, on the access patterns yeah, that you see, sure. right? But indeed, if, if you have like data that's mutated a lot, it's, but th that, it's the same is true being with cache aside, right? Y you don't yeah. do as good as you could. So guess what? So we could do we, better? Yeah, sure. I'm sure well, we you can could. try. I would screw it up, but I'm well, sure you could do better. You know me. Diagrams? Design and the code is all yours. Wow. So let's talk right behind, where we add one more component in there. Because we don't have enough components, we need one more. So let's throw in a queue. Because they're um, cool. Because they're cool, clearly, especially when unbounded. Yep. Um, you write to the cache that instead of writing to the database, actually writes to the queue, faster. So there you go, your little message for what the mutation should be. And once you've done that, you're done. The rest is up to the right behind implementation. What the right behind implementation will do is that it will potentially get a number of mutations to be applied. <coughs> Optionally, it can coalesce them if they are on the same uh, mapping, same, same key. And then at one point, it goes and writes everything to the database, completely asynchronously. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? The writer on your application no longer pay, pays the price. It just puts to the cache. What happens in case of eviction? Because remember, we said a cache can evict. So here. I have put in the cache, I have that mapping, K1, V1, very interesting mapping, but highly important. And it happens that the write did not go to the database yet. 
nasty cache users. They made my entry be evicted. Probably put another mapping, like KX, VX, something. But now I go read from the cache. Notice that K1v1 on the queue still did not make it to the database. And so here, what you really want is the cache to first go check the queue. Because if you were to go to the database directly, you would be reading stale data, which means that you've broken your application. You've opened yourself to risk condition where entry mappings could be evicted from the cache while not yet flushed to the database, and suddenly you're standing in between. And whenever it happens, just depend on load. Right. And actually, the problem that Louis is describing, it, so if anyone has used right behind with the EHCache2x line, because by the way, right behind is not part of the JSO 107 specification. <laughs> so the integration part of it is, so you can implement their own, their interfaces, well, the interfaces from the spec. Um, but you, you have no way to, to tell the cache that it needs to do as, uh, async writes. Um, so, so that you need to configure on a per implementer way, right? So, uh, but in the hcache2x days, actually, it was left to the user as an exercise to tune things properly and hope that, that whatever is in the queue makes it in, to the database prior to the data being evicted from the cache. And uh, it's hard, and things go wrong. So, um, in so we just, in HCache 3, we changed that model. Um, we, anyways, the, yeah, let's not talk about different topologies and the no, tricks that we could possibly do. And but anyways, the, the idea being that looking up the queue will still be faster than reading the underlying system of record. It will raise your latency, yes. So it will not be as quick as a hash lookup as we can do in, a, in, in the cache itself, but, but you'll still get to the latest value, nonetheless. So you probably still want to do this exercise and try to tune things so that you don't eventually like, end up walking through a queue like every time you do a key lookup, because that would be kind of dumb. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, that's, at least it's correct. And in that case, correctness prevails over um, speed. I have a question about that. Sure. <coughs> Why don't you just uh, change your eviction algorithm never to evict an item in a queue? Because then you need to make the cache way more aware of the queue than he is. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Mm? Only the eviction algorithm. The, the yeah. thing is, um, what you, <laughs> okay. So the reason why we're not doing this, you couldn't do this in HCache, it's impossible. There is no way for an eviction algorithm, I'm gonna call it like that, we have, it's composed of actually two types in HCache. Um, it's impossible for, for something like that to never ever veto effectively which is one I, I wanted to find another word but i couldn't yeah. Th there is an eviction uh veto and in, in but everything is just always a hint the cash the, the way that we look at this the it's it's kind of you're making your unbounded queue problem just bigger right because you end up again it has to do with topologies but y you possibly if it's not only a pointer to the same data structure in memory right which We'll get into topologies later. Yep. You're actually doubling your memory consumption. Y and we want the, the, the cache to always do no harm, right? And never, ever be a problem. So, for instance, heat pressure could do really harm to your system, right? And now, all of a sudden, if I need to, because again, like even the pointer, it's just not the pointer, right? It's, it's the mapping inside the data structure and so forth. But there is quite some overhead. So, we pondered that has to do with 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 the the point that Louis raised when he when when he raised the jcash 2.0 buff uh, in San Francisco we certainly in the hcash have decided that a cache is for caching that it should be not harmful to the application and and yeah and and that's the sort of line we're following the, this option all you gain by doing it that way 
is one trouble. So that one we don't want to. You've seen like when we try to do things right, how like it troubles me. Um, but the um, yeah, so so th there is no such feature by design in EHCache that would let you do this. It's and and all we're saying here we still believe that we'll get you to better latency than hitting the system of record by doing it that way. Yes, it will be higher than the one of again doing the hash lookup, but we're not talking about like huge amount. So um, so yeah. That's the idea. Uh, we'll, 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 I'll probably show later, like also the stuff that you can, how you can control the right behind queue and how it should behave and the right behind process. Because obviously, there, one thing that's not in there is you can guess there is a thread that actually like yeah, consumes those those writes and do things with them. So, anyways, yeah. But I guess the the that was a pretty one like explanation. But yeah, there is the design principle of really do no harm. And that's one thing that leads to problem. People shoot themselves in the foot effectively is what happens, right? And they go in production and all of a sudden everything barfs. And why? Uh, well, you, may, you, just, you configured your system so that your cache is effectively a recipe for disaster. And, and, and because the only way you can put back pressure to the application in case the queue drains way too slow is not by controlling the eviction mechanism of the cache. That, that's the opposite of back pressure. The only way you can do is by having a, a properly bounded queue, which will stop accepting writes into it. And then we'll slow down the application because the application re will remain blocked when interacting with the cache. But that doesn't say anything about capacity of the cache at that point. And so you're kind of, so that's why we're putting eviction first. And so just to finish clearly, um, this means we return what, you, what we saw in the queue. Um, and by default, any cache hit counts as making that mapping hot, so the mapping will make it back into the cache. Clearly, it's needed there. Yep. Uh, since we were talking about the size of the queue, mm -hmm. uh, do you compress the writes as well? So that's what, yes. I showed in the previous diagram, you can coalesce things. Um, it all depends. That's up to you. So you can batch. And if you batch, you can say, I want coalesce. And coalesce means, only write the last mutation for a given key. Um, write behind implementation is changing a lot. So whatever was published in milestone 3 of EHCache 3 is highly based on whatever was in EHCache 2x, but for the difference of going to look in the queue when, when we miss in the cache. Um, but what's coming out in milestone 4, um, we found a number of bugs while looking at the code once more. Um, and we made a number of decisions that some of the stuff we had as features could as well be implemented by wrapping the loader writer. Um, and so it, it became much simpler. And also the different configura configuration options could get really weird behavior like thread-wise and stuff. And so we simplified stuff so that you don't get into these quarter cases without realizing it. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. So, but that means, however, that I want to know answer to that question, failure. So, again, I'm writing to my cache, which means writing to the queue. I'm done. Queue stuff gets in. And here we're going to talk about one failure mode because it has an impact, a potential impact on the way you want to write um, to the database itself. I write to the database. But before I can clean up the queue, everything goes away. Again, assuming we have a proper persistent queue, when it comes back up, it reloads its content and sends it again to the database. So here what we're looking at is a classical problem. Do you want exactly once? guarantee, or at least once. And again, it's a trade-off. Um, but clearly, if you want to support like um, resilient queues that can be reloaded, you'll probably end up having at least once semantics. And so that means that you have to write your operations in a way that applying multiple times the same mutation is idempotent on your domain. 
So ordering will be preserved, coalescing, that's all fine because what we're recovering are the messages that were in the queue before we crashed. But yeah, again, you could say XA, multi like transactional queue linked to the database transaction, but then you're starting to pay the latency in a different direction. And even if you do that, then I mean, you could move one level higher and still have this, a similar problem. Good. Yeah. So we go <coughs> demo some of that. Yeah, got to <laughs> show some of that. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> you never know what can happen. All right, so in my app that is not running anymore, but hopefully it's still loaded. I have this counter thing here, right? So that's something right now that's um, on every view of the page gets incremented. And obviously I've written this to be persistent so that when I restart my application, I actually get to the amount of views that this page had, right? It's so that looks like a good use case to actually um, scale out my rights, right? Because that becomes like a very obvious contention point and beyond it becomes a very good use case for the compressing of things so that I can maybe do things a little bit smarter. So, where is this method? It's not here at all. <laughs> that would have been way too easy. So, anybody using something like right behind? Because I'm guessing EHCache is not the only one having any right. oh, A few heads. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, what I have in here to do this is this method. Right, that does the increasing of things. And I implement it in a way so that it all happens in the database, so that I don't have to know. As you can see, this is obviously, so yeah, maybe, yeah. So none of this is made transactional, right? So, so, so all of those statements live within their own transaction. So, because because what I could do is just write whatever was in the uh, in in the uh, in my object prior to this right here. But then, where is it? Views counter. Here we go. Right. So I load. I increment by one in there, and I write the whole thing back. But now, if I don't make this whole thing transactional, obviously another thread could come in, and and I would lose counter values. That would be kind of sad. Um, so I want to avoid doing that. So obviously, again, I could make it spawn an entire transaction, but then all of a sudden, like I'm introducing a huge contention point on this key for no real reason, let's say. So again, I can use my cache for that. Uh, yeah, obviously, it's in another thing. Architecture, <laughs> totally. <laughs> So I guess I need to do some live refactoring here with you. Because what I need is get this guy out. Because I don't want to create 2,000 guys here. Add a parameter to my method. Refactor. Awesome. What <laughs> was that? <laughs> Man, Google App Engine was just never let it go. Cash manager. What the hell that was? All right. I got here. I want my cash manager here. And now I can inject it back in here. Yay. Hopefully that was the right EO. Yes, it was. All right. Cash manager. So, same thing. I'm just going to copy paste this whole thing. Only this time it becomes to collection, right? So this guy now. Mm, yeah, let's create another class here. Public static. That's gonna be really confusing to have two <laughs> class with the same name. Always make this very confusing. Cash loader writer. So we set string and we set collection. And we implement all the methods. Yeah. 
And so this time what we need to do is have the, the two things going on, right? We, ha we need to have create field. Here is my cache. So what we need to do is again, same thing here, right? So let's move all of that crap inside my glue code. So we need to add the constructor. No. Why did we say that's the load? No, I just did, right? Yes. Yes. I see something is not happy, but I don't know what it is. Oh yeah, obviously this. <coughs> so now I do need to do my cache, my get, and just pass the key and return that, right? So that's what we had before. This is the way that I should have demoed this thing right before but I didn't. So we got the load, so that's all good. Now I need my write. I'm gonna cheat a bit in the sense I'm gonna make the write like only update the, um, the counter, right? Probably it could be that you would want all of that to do more. Where is the write? Here it is. Okay. So that's what we do, because we know that's the only time we'll do a mutative operation to the cache, that's what needs to happen. And so the way that this happens here now is by doing the cache, do the put, the key, and crap, I need to have the whole thing. Final collection, actually I don't need the key. Collection, because the key is obviously part of my model and the collection, right? And now I need to go where this was called because obviously that's not gonna work anymore. So as we've said, moving to um, right through generally and right behind also um, has impact on the modeling and stuff. Yeah. Cause and it's in, in this case proper design, but that's. <coughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> that is very true. So, right. So, I'm doing my put. There, I got my get to read the stuff. So, I got rid of that, right? So, hopefully, nothing else uses that. So, that's good. And uh, and I do my put. Wait a sec. Where, is, where did my get go? Oh, here. Sorry. It's in line. Right? So, I got those two things. Now, if I use this, this should work. <laughs> Let's see. You probably need to increment the counter somewhere. Well, I do that. Oh, yeah, you do that in the... That's yeah. my whole thing. Yep, yep, I yep. do this when here in the... Lo uh, well, yep. wherever it was in my glue code. Yep. I got my right. That works. So let's try if at least I've done... This should have done nothing, right? So why did I do all of that? So my application shouldn't have changed its behavior. Obviously, you no. Know, everything's gonna blow up again. <laughs> well, it's not a behavior change then. It's just a bug that needs fixing. Right. That's what's cool with defining bugs and features. You jump so from one to the that. other easily. Too much management, I guess. Okay. Yeah, you need oh. to give it a, a different name. Man. Collection. I'll create a cache with the same name twice. Who came up with this idea? <laughs> I'm not gonna name names, but it's all on GitHub. You can follow the code and <laughs> just blame. <laughs> That's what IT is all about. I always find somebody to blame. <clears throat> Normally, if I get here, so, and that doesn't work. Yes, obviously that doesn't work. So why doesn't this work? Because of you? Yes, <laughs> because of me. So what we're doing is we're indeed incrementing the counter in the database. Can I see this? Right. Obviously, uh, ID, right? No, key, what is it? Ah. 
That's uh, account. Sorry, I'm an idiot. I can't write SQL anymore. This is all way too complex, right? So we can see that we got this one here that I actually incremented to 30, but that's why can't I see this? Well, because I'm reading from my cache, right? Uh, where is it? Git collection, right? Here we go, right? We only load it once. We never update this model on this happening, so nothing happens. So we can do this. Oh, man. I can do this, I can do this. <laughs> so I think, so I think. Uh, you're nearly there. Right, so we're done. Does this look good? Yes. Yeah, you want more hints? Does this look good? <laughs> Who do you think that in production? Volatile. Volatile. Problem solved. Oh, you're asking me? Yeah, I'm, like, like, I, I, I'm coding here <laughs> for like, I don't know how long. You have total proof that I'm not worth <laughs> anything. So obviously I'm asking you, you're the manager. Are we good? Go ahead. No, sure. we're still not good. Man, can't let the manager code, ever. Right? Th this doesn't work, right? This isn't, this isn't, this isn't an atomic method. Right. Or to make, like, and use an updater and update the field. But that relates to, to what, I, what I said earlier. You need to make sure when you do those tricks that your domain is actually capable of handling like a proper multi-thread environment. Right? So I'm a lazy guy, so I'm just going to do it this way, because that works too. Uh, but, but yeah, so because if, if, I don't, if I don't synchronize there, or, or use an atomic integer, or blah, 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 like, have a pr like they would do the whole casing magic for me, right? If two threads come around, like they interleave, like this, uh, this counter plus plus does read, add one, write, um, right? So obviously, the threads can interleave, this is going to be a problem. And it's, I'm going to drift in this case, because what I've done in my collection, the L, over here, right? The write, what the write does, it calls this method. This method will not suffer from this bug, right? So I'm going to lose writes. So, so how, wh what would that mean? So what this will mean is that under concurrent load, and I expect this website to have billions of users, <laughs> It's going to increment. It's going to lose increments on whatever is on heap, okay? But it's going to increment properly in the system of record. Now, at some point, this value will be evicted because nobody looks at this thing anymore, or it just got chosen as being like less hot than other thing. And then somebody looking at the whole thing would see this jump all of a sudden, right? Because he would see, I don't know, 25k from the racy situation that I have in my model and then all of a sudden jump to 35k because the, the underlying system of record incremented things properly. So I need to fix this. So I fixed this with my synchronize here. So now we're good. So let's rerun this just to make sure that the counter increment. And so again, here we're just going through, right, right through. So we haven't touched right behind yet. No, nope. we haven't touched right behind. This is, I'm just making this very agile, you know? Yeah. One bug at a time. <laughs> <laughs> it's called a feature in that case. So, is this running? Somehow my computer gets slower and slower. I think I should get a new one, manager. <coughs> All right, here we go, right? So you just saw like what I just, like would be what talked about we were at 25 and we jumped all the way to 30 because the underlying system of record updated the model in memory wasn't updated at all in this case but updating it racially would just effectively be the same right it would be wrong it's just a situation in which it's observed is different all right so that's all good and, and nice and so forth so now if we want to make this red behind so i should probably have a quick look at this thing here because these are, so this is how you configure this. Um, <coughs> and as you can see, there, there are a bunch of things that you can decide on. Now, obviously, a bunch are gone. Is that true? <laughs> yes. 
Well, which one should it's, I talk it's gonna, about? It's going to be, you know, it's going to look different, but what's there still right. remains, just slightly different. So the queue size is obviously how you bound yep. each queue. Yes. Concurrency level is how many queues you want to have. Yep. So what you can do is you can actually shard your queues so that you can say, oh, I want four queues and like if I make this a four, right? And so that would mean I could have in queues at most 12 things at time. And um, what, what each cache will do is it will make sure that ob like obviously a given write for a given key always goes, well, a given, actually a given anything, a, a, a given mutative operation goes to the same queue, right? Yes. For you? You need that for ordering. Right. We've been told ordering is good. Batch size lets you specify how many of those things should be written out. So that has to do with the other methods that I haven't implemented, which are here. No, which are not here. Where are they? Like my write hall. All right. I would say, all right, I want to write three things at the time so that. I can maybe maximize what I do within a given transaction, or, or I don't know if, if you're actually going to rest endpoint somewhere far on the internet. You may want to send more payload at once to that thing. And all right, so the, the coalescing is the stuff that we just mentioned that lets you actually, in the case of my, um, of that, that use case here, well, I got um, page counts going on. I can actually only, instead of writing like each and every single increment to the system of record, that's not really useful, right? I can just say, all right, well, what you'll do is you look at all the writes that you have, you just keep the latest thing and you, you write that out to the underlying system of record. Yeah. And the delay... Yeah, let's keep delay. That's changed for sure. Um, what you'll have right. as a way of controlling is whenever you use batching, you can specify how old a batch gets to be, like an incomplete batch gets to be before it's force flushed. So if you have a batch of 100 and you have only 92 modifications, it could sit there forever, waiting for the last eight to complete the batch. And so you'll have a way to say, OK, it's either two minutes or a batch of 100, which is a way of controlling, like throttling the rights to the database. Um, and again, that. That means also both batching and that delay are per queue. So adding the thing in, obviously. Right behind. <laughs> Configuration builder. Oh. Or builder, yeah. Come on. Right. I don't need to build it, right? So if I do that, I'll get all the defaults. All the defaults, yes. Which so is one queue size would be max long, so you probably want to change that at one point. Um, no delays and stuff like that. Max long? That's not a big queue. No. <laughs> Boy, if you have very, very small object, it's fine. <laughs> right. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, that's the problem with sensible defaults. I think if I would be using JRebel, it would be faster. So maybe I don't need a new computer. <laughs> Why am I saying this? Talk to them. <laughs> All right. Let's see if that works. And here we go. So good, no change. That means what we've done still works as before. We're good. Well, actually, we're not. Because you mentioned something about failure. Yeah. Failure never happens, right? <laughs> well, except in my presentations. But anyways. <laughs> only the demo. <laughs> only the demo. <laughs> I'm doing only the demo. And <laughs> um, OK. So. Failure, right? So what was what was up with that? 
stuff can go wrong. So what, what I want to do is probably fix this thing, right? Because this is not idempotent, right? If this method gets executed twice, I will have more views on my page than it actually got. So let's be honest, this is not the best example. Because <laughs> honestly, if I pretend there were 25,000 one hits instead of 25,000 hits being the correct value, I don't think anybody's going to lose his job. Yeah, but at the same side, I mean, this doesn't work if you want to enable batching and coalescing. And coalescing, yeah. If, if you enable coalescing, then you've got the same drift problem we discussed earlier, but in the different direction. So the in-memory will have the correct count, and the database may miss some. Right. So, but you know what? Let's move on because of time. Yeah, let's move on. But effectively, you just want to update with the thing that you get in the queue. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and it's so you want to use the collection object to update, and then and then you're done. All right. Because so we talked right behind enables you to scale your writes, so that's good. Um, you've got to consider this batching and coalescing option because they give you even more control. But coalescing especially needs um, thought about uh, the queries that get executed, as we've discussed. Um, do you want a persistent queue or not? Failure resilience in that case. And it may make um, idempotent operations important, um, especially if we go distributed and have failure conditions that we want to be resilient to. So now, one more feature, which is called refresh ahead. So here, what you want to do is the usual, you read from the cache, like in, in a cache through um, system, it's again a variant of cache through. You want to read from the cache, it's not there, it goes load from the database, returns, everything is good. But you've got like a 20 second expiry, and the time it takes to load the cache is pretty important. And you would rather pay that price initially, once, and then never have a thread hit a missing entry um, or an expired entry. Still, eviction can happen, but that's <coughs> you can solve that by properly sizing, potentially. So later on, you go hit the cache. You find a value, but the cache realizes, oh, that value is soon to be expired. I'm going to asynchronously, after I've returned control to the user, go back to my database and refresh the content of my cache. Hence the refresh ahead term. So that's useful because then normally never will, a user, will a, an application thread cause it's an expiry and then have to reload again. It just happens in the background automatically. That's for expiry, obviously, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's expiry. Not for eviction, so because that would yeah. sort of defeat the purpose. But yeah. And so you can do one more variant on that, which is schedule refresh. So here it's again the same. You hit the cache, no entry, you go to the database. But as soon as you go back to the cache, you actually add a timer, which will make sure the cache goes refresh automatically after whatever is the timing you've decided on. And so again, enables you to control what's in the cache and how fresh it is. So now, I guess, we're getting to the last part, which was scaling. Because um, we've discussed everything, like single VM, heap memory, everything's fine. But you're actually wanting to use more and more of that memory. And so the thing we realized from the CPU stuff at the beginning was that the farther you are from the CPU, the costier is it to get to the data. And it's exactly the same. Inside your application, on heap, pretty fast. From disk, pretty slow. From network, might be faster, but still, it depends on what has to happen on the other machine at the end of the network pipes. Um, and so what you want to be able to do is increase the size of what you have closer to you. But again, you're going to pay some price of latency. So you'll get increased latency, but probably more data cached. Um, and so it's the case in EHCache, at least. Um, you've got different tiers of storage. Um, heap, off heap, and then disk, um, and so that's way of that's one way of scaling um, 
scaling up. So that's one thing that was announced earlier this year. Um, Terracotta open sourced the Afib implementation. So the reason for going Afib is you all know JVMs have issues with large heaps, uh, mostly due to garbage collection. While garbage collection is great, it suffers from the size from a size problem. Um, and Afib is a really nice alternative for data that has a well-known life cycle. That's exactly a cache. Expiry, eviction, you've got a pretty well-known life cycle. It's all controlled by the cache itself and depending on your access patterns on it. So it's a perfect match. Of course, when you move off heap, you can't use your plain old Java objects directly because you're no longer on the heap. So you have to serialize them, moving to a binary form. So that takes time, both writing and reading. Um, but it's a, it's a great way of scaling to potentially hundreds of gigs without impacting your garbage collection times. Several terabytes, actually. Yeah. But I'll, I'll let that. If so you, if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you've got a big enough machine. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> so if you want to know more, um, there is a talk on Thursday on the Terracotta Alfip implementation, room 10, by Chris Dennis. Um, Who's merging pull request on this thing? Yeah. <laughs> so I managed to get his picture there. Um, so that's one way. That was scaling out. Um, and <coughs> other implementers have similar. Um, offerings um, like Offheap is getting uh, more and more common in different caching um, products. Um, the other way you want to um, scale out is actually moving to multiple machines. But all the problems of consistency we discussed on a single VM with a given cache become much bigger problems when you move to multiple VMs. Because then, you, I mean, you were already duplicating the data but in the same VM, and now you're duplicating the data potentially across different VMs. So clustering in the context of caching, we talk about a cache that's shared between multiple machines. Um, we can have different topologies, like peer-to-peer -peer system. I think um, Hazelcast coherence by default will work like that. Um, you have client-server um, systems. That's the way Terracotta works, and we're going to see that in detail in a minute. Um, and when you move to a client server model, you can have or not a local um, client cache. And like I said, consistency. That suddenly becomes the, the big problem for you. So that's a bit the um, current architecture of Terracotta. Um, so again, um, open sourced version 4.3 um, back in April. Um, so you have again, um, with the HCache2x, a clustering option available. Um, and the way this works is this is one of your application instance with a big memory enabled cache. That's kind of marketing term, but that's what on the slide. But they have great slides, right? Yeah. The slides look very good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can see I didn't do that one. Right. Um, you said that. And, and Terracotta is a client server model, so you need a server to be running, which is going to be called the active server. Um, and the active server can have a mirror can have mirrors for high availability so that if the active crashes, uh, a passive takes over. And you can scale out by just having multiple of these. So like you shard your data then across, well, Terracotta will shard your data across the different stripes that can each have active and passives. Um, so that's good, but then how does that work? So with each cache, you have two main um, consistency mode, the first one is strong. And you'll see that by strong, we really mean it. Um, but you can imagine that it has its costs. So that means if you were to write to the cache, internally inside the VM, that goes into the Terracotta client, which handles the clustering, which then sends the new value to the server. But of course, I mean, we're in a distributed world. So what's interesting is having multiple clients. But these clients may have a copy of the data. So we need to invalidate. And since we want strong consistency, um, we can't return for the client. We have to wait for all the clients to be properly invalidated, which can be cost costly. Um, one client may answer fast, but another one may be busy and have, take more time to answer. 
And the, once you're done, then you can go back to the Terracotta client and let the cache know, oh, we're done. You're done, you've done the put, and no one else in the cluster, I mean, we've established a strong habits before relationship, which is hard to observe from the outside, but we have it um, internally. Um, of course, it's really useful for data where you have these needs, um, but you will want to use um, a loser consistency mechanism whenever you can for performance. So in that case, we move to what we call eventual consistency, where the cache gets the mutation, mutation goes to the client, and the client says, hey, I'm done. And it actually asynchronously sends the mutation to the server, which then goes invalidate the other clients. Hence the eventual in the consistency this time. And also, you realize that if others' clients are performing mutation on the same key, the total ordering that we talked about at one point in cache coherence um, rules, uh, the total ordering will be determined by the server. So the clients may have different views on how events happened. The only guarantee is that if on the server B happened after A, then none of the clients will ever see A if they've already seen B. So that was kind of a rush through the um, um, scaling up and scaling out. But the whole point that um, trying to illustrate that at the end going pretty fast is that ideally your caching solution remains pretty much the same inside your application. You have a few issues to take care of, but otherwise it should be pretty much transparent. You may need tweaks, you may need to, indeed if you want to benefit from eventual consistency, you may need to make sure that your model, your usage model supports it, but otherwise it's the same cache interactions you've had in the past. The, the um, usage model being also like, should be like use case driven, not data driven. Um, I take the example of um, very randomly listing um, the free hotel rooms that you have for now, right? Well, when somebody's searching for it, the fact that it may not really be available anymore is probably not a big deal. But when somebody books this room, you probably really want to make sure like, yeah. that it's available and not that you end up with, well, it could be a good surprise on the other hand, I don't know. Yeah. Could be a business model. Oh. Anyways. <laughs> um, right. Uh, you want me to go so, Yeah, go ahead. Quickly? So the, the, what, what the title here is, is probabilistically bounded stillness. That's a way of looking at what exactly do you mean by eventual. Because eventual, in the schema that was described before, places no bounds. We never said you'll ever see B. We said you'll eventually see B. What does that mean? Right, that could be that could be a long time, yeah. and and so this um, this PBS effort um, you can actually look things up online, which is probably the best way to do this because with the seven minutes thirty seconds yeah. left, this is going to be a flash now. Anyways, the idea is like, what does it mean? Like, how long before it really gets visible to others? Um, and and measuring this is kind of interesting. Um, the other question that comes around from there is like how many old versions, like for how long are old versions around and, and how many of these are around, right? What we mean by how many is, let's say we went from one, two, three, four, five. Is it so that when five gets written, at worst, like people see four and three, but one and two are like all forgotten about? Or is it so that actually there is big disagreement across the cluster of what the values are? And, and those could be depending on, on like, the answer to those two questions is depending on network delays, what what each processing node actually has to do. So in the case of the client cache, for instance, when the server invalidates something, well, you know, all of, it needs to be invalidated. The work has to happen. Uh, delayed replication, like if you start batching stuff together in order to uh, favorize uh, throughput. Yeah. So, and at, there is, there's been, they've been looking at into those issues, and um, so that's one statement that I stole from the whole thing. So LinkedIn measured 
like run the tool there and, and measure things. And so as it turns out, they end up with 99.9% .9 of the time, the latest value is observable within 30 milliseconds. So that's pretty darn quick. Uh, with SSDs, they got that even down. Now, what's interesting is that what you, what you actually make is your app being able to make progress. When you go for like stronger consistency models or very pessimistic things, all of a sudden what you end up with is actually th thread that have to wait before they can actually see the state. And people tend to forget that, right? So you will always see the latest value, but getting to the latest value could mean waiting 20 milliseconds, right? So actually maybe your use case makes it so that you can live with exposing an older value for three milliseconds instead, but having your whole cluster actually like everybody making forward progress. So anyways, interesting stuff to think about. I always thought that this whole like uh, eventual consistency sounds really good. And when you read the definition, actually, I don't see how you can actually do anything with this. So that leads to the conclusion. Yeah, and hopefully a few minutes for question. Um, you know it all. <coughs> Go ahead, have fun with caching. Measure first. And yeah, don't be afraid. Yeah, I think you should consider caching early on when you do stuff. What I mean by this is not this, well, actually, maybe being able to introduce it early could be good, which is, I don't know. Um, but, but, um, they works, right? What I've showed you, for instance, in my awesome application there, you know, that made like a whole lot of jumping through hoops. And an application much simpler than this doesn't really exist, right? So you, like in more complex application, considering that maybe you, you may want to go that round, like an arch architecture decision <laughs> may be a good thing to do. So, yeah, so clearly having a design that allows you to plug caching in without major refactorings. Right. Um, don't, uh, don't necessarily have to do it entirely, but anyways, account for it. Be um, ready for it. Topologies? Yeah. How big will you grow? How fast? Is it worth making sure you're discussing like right behind the impotency operation, that kind of stuff? Or is it just a dream and you're never going to get there because you don't need it? I mean. So that's it. Thanks for your time. Um, any questions? This is for my demos. I take it <laughs> all. Thank you so much. So if there are any questions, yeah? So how about um, a situation where you want to catch a singleton? How would you pull that? Do you have some failure that you need? Sometimes, let's say, the right configuration. It is difficult, expensive to recompute. OK. The configuration may change once in a while, but there can only be one instance. So the question being around caching one instance only, I'm actually not sure I understand the question, because I. It, Sorry? In the beginning of your presentation, you guys said use the right terminology and caching. You said caching only applies in the case where you have uh, policies and then Right. The, the, yeah. The, 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 so, yeah, the, that you could go without. So, that seems to be a fair case for caching, as far as I'm concerned. The fact that the singleton doesn't really change that, right? If the thing's gone, your application will survive. It just happens so that eviction of one, you actually solve the problem by itself, right? It will never be evicted. So it'll always be around. So actually, I think it's the easier sort of use case in that sense. You don't have to account for eviction because it's just never going to happen. Right? Another example is um, so we have a bunch of ways of sizing caches uh, in each cache. And as of 2x, you, can, you could already do it like, on, like byte based, right? so that you say, all right, only use 30% of the heap that the VM has allocated. So we're going to go through the pain of measuring exactly how big your objects are and so forth. But uh, it always had the support for like size based, uh, like count based, right? And there are just things that make sense, right? Your, your, 50, uh, uh, your 50 states, or um, I don't know how many countries there are in Europe, but whatever how many countries that, that are. That changes. What? That, that change? It changes anyway. So. OK, changes. OK, no, it needs to be stuff that doesn't change. Right? Sizing and count actually makes sense. And then, and then 
maybe you do say, all right, I got 50 states, I size the thing to 50. There's never going to be any eviction going on and problem is solved. So I think it makes the, what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that it makes it all much simpler. But the, 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 the principle still applies. You should, your application survives if the thing isn't there. It'll just go to the database and the latency will be higher because every time you go re-ask, are you sure we're still at 50 states? So apparently it may be useful. So I think it's a specialized use case. Uh, yep. And at the same time, I mean, you're paying some price when using a cache. So consider that also. Right, the differences between, I'm not sure how you ask it, so I'm gonna, I, I think the same applies in both ways. So whether you compare Guava to 107 or Guava to EH cache, I think what you get is a much more rich feature set. And certainly Guava focuses on the on heap thing, lightweight thingy, yeah. which is a, f sorry? We have some commanding, uh, so we don't need to worry about the translation of Guava. Okay. Right, right, it's it's and again, right? It's it's a uh, it's very good library, and so obviously ours is better because it comes with all the bugs that I write. <laughs> so that's non neglectable. Um, but yeah, so no, no, it, it's but, but but from a topology perspective, right? Again, the whole support for clustering, whether you want to go off heap and so forth. M maybe now Guava has all of that. I don't know. I don't think it was in scope with the stuff that they wanted to do. Maybe it grew, I don't know. No, and yeah, and they're like the, the absence, though they do have the put in the end, right? Which I thought was yes, very deceptive. But without the put, I thought this library was just so beautiful. Yeah. So, anyways, we're out of time. Thanks a lot again, and then we'll be around. So, yep, don't, don't hesitate, hesitate to, to grab us. To us. Thank you. <laughs>